Good morning. I'm Philip Rasher, Executive Editor of AgriPulse. Thank you for being here. We are really excited to see the tremendous interest in our topic uh, today. Uh, driven by data, innovation in crop insurance and conservation. And we have a great list of speakers and experts uh, with us today uh, for uh, who will be talking to you. And also we will have a facilitated uh, question and answer period. We very much want your questions. Please put them in the Q&A portion at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, chat box, the Q&A portion. And uh, we will uh, get to your questions um, during, the, uh, during the seminar. If you're experiencing any technical issues, uh, you can bring that up in the uh, uh, Q&A portion as well, and uh, our team will assist you. In addition, we'll also be uh, recording today's discussion and the webinar will be available later today at agripulse.com. I'd like to begin our program by thanking our sponsor, the Meridian Institute, and to provide some background on today's discussion, we're gonna play a short video about the PACE uh, insurance program. There's a new crop insurance endorsement for corn farmers called PACE. It provides supplemental coverage for farmers who split apply nitrogen, a practice that is good for the environment and good for a farmer's bottom line. Farmers know corn needs nitrogen at specific times in the crop's growth cycle. Apply too little or too late, and you risk a smaller yield. Apply too much or too early, and the nitrogen can run off instead of being utilized by the plant. That can lead to water quality problems and greenhouse gas emissions. Split nitrogen application is a practice where farmers make two or more fertilizer applications during the growing season, rather than one application before or at planting. PACE gives farmers the opportunity to use split apply nitrogen to increase efficiency, decrease nitrogen runoff, and optimize their financial investment. For farmers that choose this practice, PACE covers the risk of not being able to apply nitrogen at the right times later in the growing season. And if the farmer faces inclement weather when it is time for post-application, can't apply fertilizer at the right time, and suffers a crop loss, PACE could cover that risk. PACE is available for non-irrigated corn in select counties in 11 states. If farmers demonstrate demand for the product, USDA Risk Management Agency will expand eligibility over the next four years. Talk to your crop insurance agent today about PACE to learn if you qualify and if it's right for you. Visit PACECropInsurance.com to learn more. Now I'd uh, like to welcome our first speaker, Marsha Bunker. She's the administrator of uh, USDA's Risk Management Agency. And uh, she uh, came to USDA uh, last year with over 25 years of experience previously at the Farm Service Agency. And she's also a a founded an agriculture consulting uh, firm providing assistance to area farmers and ranchers uh, to work with the uh, local crop insurance agency. She's also the owner and operator of a 2,000 acre family farm. Administrator, thank you for being thank here. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Marcia Bunger. And as a corn grower myself, I'm excited to be here today to talk about a new insurance option that helps steward minded farmers, um, corn farmers, with the new option of PACE. I look forward to the discussion today with Todd, Megan, and David. And for those of you who haven't met David before, David is our senior underwriter at RMA, who played a very key role in the industry um, in formulating this new policy. And so with that, um, I'm gonna get started. And first though, I would like to, before I go into PACE, speak a little bit about the broader climate efforts that USDA RMA has been doing. At USDA, we believe farmers, ranchers, private forest landowners are the best stewards of our land. They play a critical role in fostering a healthy environment through, disaster, through climate smart management um, that conserve natural resources, build healthier soils, sequester carbon, and reduce gas house emissions. USDA's existing programs provide many of the tools to support and partner with producers for climate solutions. 
That includes crop insurance. Crop insurance and conservation go hand in hand. RMA is working diligently to advance USDA's commitment to address climate change. Um, in recent years, we've worked with the industry to improve insurance options to support conservation. For example, we took strides in the past year to support adoption of cover crops. Um, in one of those aspects, in 2021, we made permanent flexibilities around when farmers can chop, hay, graze, or um, cut their cover crops. We also launched a year ago what was called Pandemic Cover Crop Program, PCCP, a unique program that helps producers with insurance um, with insurance to manage cover crop systems, um, especially amid the financially challenging times with the pandemic. Sign up is underway now again, and to receive a premium benefit, producers must file an acreage report with their um, folks at FSA, Farm Service Agency, by March 15th. This is the second year for this program. And last year, we were astounded by the response with the acres coming in at 12.2 million acres in cover crops and $59.5 million in premium benefits. Um, we are anticipating um, this number to even be larger this year. So if you have planted cover crops followed by an insured crop for the 22 crop season, I would encourage you to um, get into FSA and to get signed up. Um, the other thing um, that I would also like to note is that this is the same time frame that FSA County offices will be taking your farm program sign up for ARC County and PLC. So there is a couple different things you can take care of all at the same time. Just give the local county office a call so that you can um, talk about scheduling an appointment so that you get in there before March 15th. Next, I'd like to talk about PACE. Um, the short video stole a lot of my thunder, but I'm just going to reiterate what was explained with that video. Um, PACE stands for Post Application Coverage Endorsement. Um, we are very excited about this new option. Over the last several years, the private process has been developing PACE as a way to look at new climate smart insurance options. PACE is a great example of how the private industry can help cultivate new ideas for the crop insurance program especially in underserved areas such as climate smart ag. PACE is scientific, it's based on data, and it empowers producers to use nutrients more carefully, good for our natural resources and for farmers managing risk. To split a pie, the grower makes two or more passes over his field during the growing season, rather than providing all of the fertilizer at, at a one-time single treatment. Um, but application of nitric, nitrogen can also lead um, to lower input costs, and it helps prevent nutrient runoff leaching into the waterways and groundwater because it, it does use a more targeted approach over multiple applications rather than one large application. PACE can provide qualifying corn farmers a reasonably priced risk management tool for the projected yield loss for those at risk of not getting that second or third application completed. PACE is offered in select counties like you saw on the map, and those um, counties are in 11 states, including Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. I would, if you are in one of those areas as a producer, I would reach out to your crop insurance agent before the um, March 15th deadline so that you can get that endorsement on there if you are interested in having that on your crop insurance coverage. It's available as a supplemental coverage for yield protection, revenue protection, and revenue protection with harvest price exclusion policies. The sales close date for PACE will be the same as the producer's underlying corn policy. Um, and that first date is March 15th of this year. And speaking of the March 15th deadline, um, that's also the deadline for producers with crop insurance who planted cover crops. So we are talking about a couple different things here, actually three in total, when you are um, looking at a deadline. PACE, that deadline to get that on your coverage is with your crop insurance agent, and that's 
March 15th. The planted cover crop premium benefit is a sign up at FSA and that's March 15th. And then also don't forget about signing up for Art County and PLC at FSA on March 15th. What are some of the other USDA priorities? We all know it's challenging times for egg producers. Impacts from the pandemic, uh, market volatility, labor, and so many other things. USDA is tackling current and emerging, and emerging challenges and looking for new opportunities to build a better America. We've been focused on beating the pandemic. COVID-19 revealed a lot of vulnerabilities in our food systems. And as we build back better, we must create more, better, and fair markets for producers and consumers alike. The food systems of the future need to be fair, competitive, distributed across the country, and resilient. RMA has continued to offer flexibilities, which we recently extended into June. We are also focused on equity and program delivery. We are committed to the values of equity and inclusion rooted in justice and equal opportunity for our employees and those we serve. Under Secretary Bill Sack's leadership, USDA is taking bold, historic action to root out generations of systemic racism, to deeply integrate equity in decision-making and policy-making, and to build equitable systems and programming inclusion of all of our employees and all of our customers. You know, this last little bit that I've just talked about with Bill Sack's leadership, it really was brought home to me personally. Um, maybe some of you do know, don't know, but I am the first woman to be named as the USDA RMA Administrator. I'm also the first woman of color to be named as the USDA RMA Administrator. And I just want everyone to know that it does happen. I applied to the Build Back Better model. Um, I sent in my resume and I have been blessed. I am very humbled to have been selected for this position. Um, so sometimes when you read, they're just words, but I want everyone to know listening today that it is just, it's, it's more than just words. It, it can happen and um, I applaud this administration's commitment to inclusion and diversity. Um, in addition, we'll seek out opportunities within the department that help ensure historically underserved groups can more fully access and participate in programs at USDA and build a workforce that is more re representative of America. This year, we announced a $2 million investment in risk management education and training focusing on historically underserved and small scale producers. This builds on almost a million dollars investment in last year's um, RME education. We just recently announced a new USDA wide equity commission that I'm excited to start working with, talking with. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I understand that we'll have questions and answer sessions and joining me is our senior underwriter, David Zanoni. We look forward to additional discussion on PACE. Thank you. Thank you, Administrator uh, Funger. I appreciate uh, your thoughts. Uh, they will help guide our uh, discussion as, uh, later, uh, as we continue the webinar. I would next like to welcome our speakers uh, each and I'll introduce each one um, one at a time. They, they have some uh, remarks they want to give and then we'll move into our uh, question and answer in our, our panel discussion. Um, we already have a couple of questions in, uh, the great ones, and uh, we will be getting to them uh, uh, as uh, soon as our uh, uh, I've introduced our panel and they have given her, uh, their thoughts. Our first speaker is uh, Todd Barker, is the CEO of the Meridian Institute. Uh, he currently leads projects that focus on agriculture, food systems, water, climate, big data, and clean energy. A highlight of his 20-year tenure at Meridian has certainly been the Agree Initiative. 
was successfully advocated and lobbied for changes in the 2018 Farm Bill uh, that supported uh, soil health. He also has extensive international experience on food and agriculture uh, issues, including but not limited to plant genetic resources, biosafety, ag innovation, risk and resilience, and climate change. Todd, I'll turn it over to Thanks, you. Thanks, Bill. It's great to great. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here, and we appreciate the partnership with AgriPulse. I'm really excited to uh, be here with the other panelists and the remarks from the administrator and, and the large number of people that signed up for today's webinar, just a little bit of context um, for more detailed conversation that will follow around PACE um, as we get deeper into the, the program. Meridian Institute, just to start there, we're a nonprofit consultancy that builds understanding and drives action through multi-stakeholder processes, engaging diverse groups. We have a team of approximately 80 people. We're currently working on over 100 active projects. Uh, about half of those are focused on uh, issues in the United States, largely U.S. federal policy uh, focus, and then the balance of our projects are international, and most of those are focused on global policy issues. We work uh, on issues related to food and agriculture, fisheries and oceans, climate and forest, uh, water quality and quantity, and more. Increasingly, we're doing work on innovative finance, big data, AI, and uh, issues related to equity. Um, and approximately a third of our portfolio, those over 100 projects, are focused squarely on food and agriculture, but almost everything I just mentioned intersects with food and agriculture in some way, shape, or form, including climate change, water quality, and quantity, and others. Um, so we're, we have a very diverse portfolio of projects. Um, so that's, that's Meridian. Um, the PACE product that we're talking to uh, about today was uh, managed by Meridian Institute in partnership with Ag Analytics, National Corn Growers Association, Illinois Corn Growers Association, AIPs and others. Um, and the origins of the PACE, the, the effort that led to the approval of the PACE product by USDA was really catalyzed through the AGREE initiative that we've uh, heard referenced here in, in the comments already. Um, and so just to say a little bit about that. So while the, the PACE product development was managed by Meridian through the 508 process that the administrator referenced, um, it was really the, the idea for this emerged through the AGREE uh, initiative. We have two, AGREE has two sister coalitions, the AGREE Economic and Environmental Risk Coalition and the Climate, Food and Ag Dialogue. The AGREE initiative, as I think many people are probably aware, um, has its origins all, right, all, way, all the way back in 2010. The uh, AGREE coalition is working actively in four areas, um, agricultural data innovation, which is really the foundation for all of our work. Um, and the next area is on crop insurance. The third area is agricultural finance and increasingly working on diversified systems. And we're very aligned in support the administrator's focus on ensuring that crop insurance benefits all farmers, including historically underserved and small scale farmers. That's a growing area of work for us. Um, we're currently working on farm bill priorities in all four of those areas. Um, we're working actively through a multi-month consensus building process with our coalition members like we did in advance of the 2018 farm bill. Um, and we really see crop insurance uh, and conservation, as, as the administrator said, going hand in hand. Um, we believe that uh, research and analysis shows that these practices reduce risk, and we're working to ensure that they're adequately recognized in an actually sound crop insurance program. We believe that it can help support uh, farmer profitability climate mitigation, adaptation, and have co-benefits, in, including improved water quality, which we know is a significant uh, challenge that we're dealing with uh, in the Mississippi River Basin and elsewhere. Um, so I think that's, those are the comments I wanted to provide. Um, the real PACE experts are gonna preceded me and follow me, um, but just a little bit about Meridian Institute, the AGREE Initiative, and uh, our interest in, in PACE. Well, we will back. We'll be back to you, Todd. You have some you got some other projects, some other irons in the fire. We want to hear a little bit about those as well. But we'll be, so we'll be back to you. 
Next, uh, we have Megan Dwyer. She is the Nutrient Loss Reduction Manager for the Illinois Corn Growers Association. She lead Illinois Corn's water quality and sustainability initiatives focused on implementing the Iowa Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy and meeting su supply chain sustainability demands. And we're all hearing more and more about uh, those, what uh, companies are asking uh, farmers to do. Uh, Megan, uh, talk about PACE. Thanks, Phil. Good morning. Glad to be here. Uh, so you might wonder why Illinois Corn is interested in PACE and, and where our involvement and interest stemmed from. As you mentioned, uh, I do a lot of work with the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy. So Illinois Corn obviously is very focused on the profitability of Illinois corn farmers, but we are equally committed and concerned about meeting the goals of the Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy and ensuring that you know the nutrients and fertilizer that a farmer uses stays in the field and is used by the crops. And so we always are trying to think about ways that we can help farmers uh, to do you know, best management practices and, and balance and, and mitigate the things of economic, agronomic and environmental impact and risk. And so our internal research will show us that our growers are telling us that the number one reason that they are concerned about split applying nitrogen or maybe hesitant to do so is that risk of not getting that application made. And so that stemmed uh, and kind of helped develop where PACE came from. And so providing, as Todd mentioned, an administrator, uh, that risk mitigation, that true data-driven, actuarially sound product that will help a farmer uh, ensure that risk and, and be more confident in split applying that nitrogen, using it when the, uh, having it there when the crop needs it. You know, we think about the climate mitigation and we see in Illinois more frequent and intense rainfall events. So anytime that we can ensure that, that that application is made really at the time of when the crop needs it, it can quickly take it up. Uh, we limit the amount that is gonna be lost, which is obviously an economic uh, driver for a grower, but also the, uh, the environmental side and, and ensuring that we don't see that, that nitrogen make its way down into the Mississippi and ultimately down to the Gulf of Mexico. So really excited about this product and looking forward to diving into our conversation this morning about some of the efforts we've done and, and worked on to really promote and, and get pace, pace kicked off uh, on the right foot. Okay, thanks, Megan. Uh, also joining us is uh, a real expert on this program on, uh, on, on uh, crop insurance. Uh, that's David Zanoni, a senior underwriter at uh, USDA RMA. He provides oversight and program design, risk management, and special projects. He's uh, led several climate efforts, including the impl implementation of the conservation compliance for federal crop insurance following the 2014 Farm Bill when they relinked conservation compliance uh, to farm programs, farm conservation programs. Um, he also uh, stewarded, uh, as it was mentioned um, by Administrator Bunger, he, uh, he uh, stewarded the uh, privately developed uh, post-application coverage endorsement product, or PACE. Uh, by the way, congratulations on uh, a great product name that everybody can remember. And that's launching this year, and that's obviously the uh, main topic of uh, our webinar. David, um, uh, your thoughts. Uh, we've already have already have some questions lined up for you. And by the way, uh, if you uh, if you tuned in late, uh, put your questions in the Q and A um, portion on the bottom of the uh, on the bottom of your uh, screen, not the chat box, but the Q and A portion, and uh, we will try to uh, get to all of them. Uh, David. Yeah, I don't have too much more to add. I think Administrator Bunger did a good job of kind of giving an overview, and I'm glad to be here and looking forward to some of the questions coming in. Okay, well, we'll put the first question to you then. Uh, and if we can put the, uh, the map back up uh, to show where uh, uh, PACE is being offered this spring. Um, David, how did, you, uh, how did RMA select these particular areas? Yeah, so I expected this question to come in because um, we have gotten that question quite a bit. Um, obviously, the map does look a bit kind of awkward, but uh, let me try to give folks some background on kind of how this process works. So um, when you have a private submitter propose a crop insurance product, they submit it uh, to our uh, the SEIC Board of Directors, the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation Board, um, and they have to go through a, a variety of steps to review it. 
Um, RMA does a review. They also contract with five external reviewers to look at it. So this went, this process um, happened with Pace. Um, and as with every product, there's some pros, there's some cons, and um, we have to analyze that. And so uh, with Pace, one of the things that um, was called out was there's a complexity to it and a, a newness in design that folks haven't seen before. And so there was some concern that with something that new, if you go too big too quickly, um, there could be um, adverse impacts on producers, which isn't what, what we want, right? We want to have a good quality product that, that people understand and can buy. And so there was a strong desire um, by our board to um, limit the scope of the initial year of implementation to a, to a pilot area. Um, and so then there's this question of, well, which areas are our best to pilot? On the one hand, we have a sense of where we think there's the most demand. Um, and as you kind of expect, it's that it kind of Iowa, Illinois corridor. Um, but then we also need some geographic diversity. You know, what would this product do up in say North Dakota, right? You know, that's, that's also some information that might need to be known. Um, but again, so you kind of have these two competing forces of wanting geographic diversity, but not wanting too much acreage. Um, and so uh, the board was looking to try to limit to uh, maybe about a quarter of the non-irrigated corn acreage in each state, what counties would represent that. Um, obviously, you know, some states are going to be more, some will be less. Um, and then we tried to use some of the kind of NASH reporting districts as a kind of a natural grouping. Um, and so what you see here um, certainly is not perfect. I mean, I think we could argue that this county should be in and that, that out and where the lines are drawn, but it was just the best attempt for a, a, a first run of trying to get some contiguous counties, but also getting that diversity. Um, I, you know, it, it's, you know, there's always gonna be that, that person that's one county off that, that feels left out or, or they've got acreage in there. Um, and so we understand that, but that's uh, just part of the challenge with the pilot. So we're hoping though, that we get a good first year and then there'll be opportunities to, to add as we gain that uh, experience. So uh, based on the feedback we get, we'll bring that back to the submitter of the product, who ultimately kind of um, shepherds that. I will bring that back to the board, and then ultimately that will be the decision that our board will have to uh, make with uh, the product submitter to uh, figure out the, the proper um, expansion path. Uh, David, I want to turn to uh, Megan uh, for an example of how this would work in, uh, say, a sample county. But uh, first, uh, talk about if you could talk about how the premium was determined based. You've got a variety of areas in terms of precipitation. That's one of, I mean, it's one thing that's obvious from your map is if you do have a, a, a variety in terms of uh, climate. Uh, uh, but could you uh, just tell us how, how the, pre, the premiums for this policy endorsement were uh, arrived at? The additional costs that farmers would pay. Yeah, so th that's something the submitter does. So during product development, they um, that part of the process is they have to collect um, data um, of the practice um, of the loss events um, and go through um, actuarial models. Um, they're required to get an actuarial certification that, um, that the expected losses um, are well understood and, and thus the uh, appropriate premium rate can be charged, um, as well as making sure that the policy doesn't suffer from things like moral hazard and adverse selection that could um, damage those premium rates, but it is data driven. Um, it's not someone just that pulls something out of a hat or some political process. It is based on what the data show of the likelihood of these type of um, events that would uh, prevent post application um, from occurring um, within the insured acreage. So um, it is it is deep actuarial math, which I won't bore your participants <laughs> with uh, of how to calculate all that, but um, it is a data driven process. And uh, Megan, uh, how does this pencil out? Could you, uh, could you give us uh, an example of uh, how this uh, could work uh, financially um, for farmers? Yeah, definitely. And, in Illinois. Sounds great, yes. Um, and we do have a great tool. I think the links are um, on the, the page, the webpage uh, where you registered, but you can get on in any county and state uh, that's um, in the pilot area right now. Farm Doc with University of Illinois does have a tool that you can go on and play around with. Um, so I guess a, a couple things to frame up, you know, pace in this product and, and how it might work for a grower. So we remember that this is ensuring an event. So this endorsement is an add-on to a base policy for a grower. So 
pace itself is not ensuring or covering a yield loss, but it's ensuring the event of being able to get that nitrogen application made in a window between V3 and V10. So with the product in this policy, you need to put at least 20% of your nitrogen on upfront. So that could be a fall application, that could be a pre-plant. And then you're looking to protect that you know, 25 to 80% post-application um, coverage that would happen between V3 and V10. So in this scenario, and then you can choose your, your coverage rate and it's gonna be based off of um, you know, your APH uh, is taken into account as well. So a 75 to 90% PACE coverage level. In this example, we're looking at LaSalle County in Illinois, looking at a projected price of $5.80. In this grower situation, we're looking at a 220 bushel APH. Uh, the grower went with uh, saying that they're going to apply 40% of their nitrogen post-application, again, in that V3 to V10 window. Uh, so in this instance, on a 90% uh, PACE coverage level, the farmer would pay a $2.82 premium per acre on those um, enrolled acres if uh, weather prevented them from applying their nitrogen. So we think too wet uh, problem, they cannot physically get that nitrogen applied between V3 and V10, then the payout would be a $69 per acre, uh, a payout to the grower again for not being able to uh, make that event happen, not make that post application happen. So, um, and you can see the example in the chart here varies be uh, differing between what a grower would put on uh, for the percentage of their post application and then variances between that coverage level. And so, um, again, we think about this uh, as really that, that risk mitigation, why we structured uh, PACE the way we did with it being this endorsement and a true insurance product is being able to ensure that risk. You know, it's a truly defined risk. It has the science and the, the backing behind it to show us, um, you know, what is at stake. And so that is of kind of the premise on, on where PACE is and what it might look like uh, on your farm. Great. And uh, Megan, what kind of uh... What are you hearing so far from uh, producer growers in Illinois uh, yeah. in terms of this? And uh, do we, what data do we have on um, to the extent that uh, farmers are already using split application? And I assume yeah. the goal here is to encourage uh, even more of it. It definitely is. That's a great question. So we've been working really hard uh, to promoting and get growers and uh, agents very excited about PACE in Illinois. So a few things we've done here, uh, we mailed out a postcard to over 50,000 farmers in applicable counties in Illinois um, that's been very well received. We know, again, as it's been mentioned multiple times today, that the deadline's March 15th. So we have a very short window uh, to make sure that growers are aware of this and, and understand uh, what the, the product is. We also sponsored a webinar just for crop insurance agents uh, in, again, those applicable counties. We had over 100 agents register. We had over 80 attend the event live had phenomenal Q&A. Uh, we did follow up with them afterwards. And from the agent perspective, uh, just under 70% said that they did find this product to be valuable uh, for their clients. And again, 70% said that they plan to be discussing this with their clients over the next uh, several weeks. And so we feel really good that, you know, they're starting to understand what this is. And, and again, that value that um, you know, I've talked to several local agents in my area, so we farm as well, and, you know, they're already thinking through how this can benefit their customers, and they've got, um, you know, they know growers right now that typically do split apply most of their nitrogen, and so talking through, hey, this is another tool in your toolbox, uh, this is something that could really provide value uh, to your farm. Okay. Uh, we've got some uh, questions coming in uh, specifically about how PACE uh, works. Uh, David, I want to turn back to you uh, for a moment to, to address these and we can move into some bigger picture questions. Uh, but one of the, what uh, someone is asking here, and that's a great question, is how, this loss, how the loss adjustment uh, process is going to work. Uh, could you talk about that, how you... Uh, and how you determine, uh, verify that um, uh, a grower was unable to uh, make their uh, nitrogen application. Yeah, so this is one of the, um, kind of one of the things we really want to pilot because this is kind of one of the more complicated pieces. Um, so there's kind of three phases or three kind of gates um, that, that trigger loss. Uh, the first being is there needs to be some sort of weather event that prevents um, the ability of the producer to get out on the field. And so that needs to be verified that, um, and there's a model to help 
uh, loss adjusters determined that yes, uh, the weather suggested as such that they, uh, the producer could not have gotten in the field during the uh, the critical window there, the V3 to V10, I believe, um, uh, stage. Um, and so that that's kind of gate one. Was there a weather event during that window that would have prevented the, the producer? Um, step two is, did the producer have nitrogen that they actually could have put down? Right? Were, were they actually um, injured in the sense that um, they, they were ready to put the nitrogen down? So if you didn't have access to any nitrogen, you can't get a loss. But if you have records that either you know had it on farm or you had the agreement to, to purchase it, um, you have to show that, that um, the nitrogen was available to put down. Um, and third, there needs to be some evidence of nitrogen stress on the crop. Um, so if the crop is completely healthy and you wouldn't have put it down anyways, you don't just get a, a free payment, right? Um, there needs to be damage to the crop. Um, but that said is once those are determined that there was a weather event, you had nitrogen, there's nitrogen stress, um, the loss is actually determined by some well-recognized scientific models on here's how much yield you would have had had you been able to put it down. And then that, that determines your loss along with your deductible. Um, the only other thing to keep in mind with PACE is there is an offset. If you suffer a loss that's so severe that your underlying policy triggers, then your underlying policy takes over at a certain point. So if it's just a, a light kind of shallow loss, sometimes people call it, um, PACE will, will get you that coverage. But if you have a more catastrophic event, um, say, you know, a drought comes in also on top of it and it wipes, wipes you out, um, your underlying uh, policy will cover that. So there's kind of a, a, a lot of complexity, a lot of steps there, but at the end of the day, could you put that down nitrogen, but the weather prevented it? That's the most important thing to keep in mind. Okay, a couple of other specific questions. One, we have a viewer who wants to uh, know if biologicals uh, uh, will be recognized as, uh, as an initial nitrogen application. So I believe as currently written, the answer to that is no. Um, I think that's an area though that we're open to feedback if, um, if that's a, a critical practice that we, needs to be recognized, that we need to know about that and we get to the submitter for possible enhancements in the future. Um, but I think for the initial year, um, that, that's not um, considered uh, an initial application. Okay. The other question is, is, must we apply two passes of nitrogen? What if some was applied last fall and we apply the remainder during V2 to V6? Assume I know the answer to this, but I'll let you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's designed for the split application. So the assumption is some is applied the previous fall, some is applied in season um, during, the, during the, the window, the pace window. So um, if you do all in the fall, you're not eligible. If you do all in season, which is pretty rare, but um, you're not eligible. It is meant for split, um, split application. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With the, with the, to cover the risk that you can't get back in your field to apply the nitrogen in January and June. Right. I mean, the, the, the worry here is nitrogen deficiency, severe. right? right. Is, right. Hey, you had a prescription of how much you wanted to put on and you didn't get that much on because the weather didn't let you. That is the risk that this is trying to cover. Uh, here's a question I'm going to pitch to you, Todd or Megan, either, either one. If a farmer isn't saving money on nitrogen through this method, what's the incentive? to buy this uh, endorsement. Go ahead, Megan. I'll jump in on this. So again, we're thinking about why a grower, even if you are, if your current system is already set up to split apply your nitrogen, um, or if you're considering it, this is really looking at to help offset the risk. So if you're in a position where you typically are planned, and, and with this program, Todd mentioned it earlier, or David, excuse me, mentioned earlier, where at that March 15th, when you're enrolling this in this product, you pretty much put down what your planned nitrogen plan looks like. You know, what was already done in the fall, what's gonna go on pre-plant, what is your intended split application going to be? So then when you're in season and you're, you're facing with a, a tough decision of, I can't physically get this nitrogen on, uh, what am I gonna do? And so then you're left with a couple decisions. You do nothing and you risk whatever happens with the crop, a potential crop failure. You do what would be considered a rescue treatment. A lot of time that's an aerial application that's not nearly as efficient in most cases, or this, this is where this product comes in and you know that you've got the insurance to back you and that is going to cover you from some of that financial harm um, from not, make, not having that application happen. And so again, it's all about protecting our risk and adding different tools to the toolbox. 
Okay. And we have some forward looking questions. Uh, not surprisingly, we have a number of folks who want to know what's uh, what's next. Uh, one is uh, when this uh, one of our questioner wants is interested in this being expanded to Chesapeake, uh, Chesapeake Basin, and I'm sure there are other regions interested as well. Um, what are the plans for expanding this, David? Maybe you can address this particular question. What are, what are you going to be looking at at RMA uh, in terms of this pilot? What uh, uh, parameters uh, in terms of uh, uh, expanding it to other areas? And uh, what areas uh, would you be looking at uh, most likely first? I mean, it's a tricky question to answer because it all depends, right? I'm one is, you know, how does the, did the pilot go, right? I mean, there's always issues. Every every new product has issues. What type of issues were they? Were they were they issues of, of, of fraud, right? You know, that's one type of problem that you have to look at. Was it issue of actuarial soundness? Was it issue of uh, marketability? I mean, so the first things first is let's see what happens in terms of this product and what type of issues pop up. What do people like about it, though? What are those pros? Um, and so do we need to expand kind of around the area that's that's successful? Um, do we need to try new areas? Do we need to have policy revisions? Are there um, rate adjustments that are required? I mean, there, there's a lot of different solutions based on what type of problem you have. So I think that's step one um, is to identify what those are. Um, the next piece of the course is, you know, it is a private product process. So RMA doesn't just change it, right? It's the, the submitter needs to kind of lead the charge on uh, where they think the product needs to go. So although we'll assist them, um, provide them the data we have, the feedback we get, um, you know, they do need to kind of decide of how they want to take their product out. And so um, the way that typically works is these submitters work with growers of, hey, there's a demand out here. I would buy this product if you could get it out here. Um, and we can help connect um, growers with the submitter um, to have those conversations. Because um, then when the submitter comes to our board of directors, say, hey, I've got a letter here from growers in Chesapeake Bay Area that say that they're ready to buy, just get it out here. Um, and that's that's a powerful statement to our board that there's a reason to try expanding that. So um, I would encourage that type of uh, collaboration between growers and the submitter, which again, RMA is more than happy to facilitate um, to make that cases of, of, of this is where this product is needed, so. Okay. Todd, I wanna to bring you in on a couple of, uh, couple yeah. of questions. Again, uh, uh, future, Questions we have uh, some someone is uh, wondering uh, when this could will it be, ever be offered for crops other than corn, um, which also need uh, nitrogen obviously. And another question um, is uh, is there any indication that we uh, might uh, have endorsements or for uh, other types of conservation practices like uh, conservation drainage management? Um, uh, which could reduce nutrient loss to waterways. A couple of two, other crops, other practices. Oh. Yeah, and let, let me first so pick up, let me first pick up on David's comments about pace and then I can get to those two questions. So we do intend uh, to be working very closely with our partners, um, Illinois Corn, National Corn, the other partners in that developed the PACE product. And we're all in on March 15th right now, getting the word out there, working with our partners, um, answering questions, working with RMA. Um, but once we get past March 15th, then we're gonna really turn our attention to uh, creating processes to engage with farmers directly with our partners um, to get their feedback on the product look at where we're hearing about demands and in, in other regions, how can the product be improved, all the things David mentioned. So we'll have a very active process um, starting after March 15th. We've met with insurance industry uh, uh, associations and leaders. We've been working with farm groups uh, at the state and national level. We also recently held uh, a, a Zoom meeting with a number of companies that have uh, aggressive sustainability programs in the Midwest and getting the word out to their farmers. And so once we get past March 15th, we'll really be working on looking ahead uh, to March, 2023. So um, we're, we're excited for that process. And as David said, we'll be working in, in partnership with them uh, and others. So in terms of uh, other 
potential products and practices. Uh, it, we, we are using the 522, 508 process that we use to develop the PACE product, working with the same partners to develop PACE to advance another 508 submission to USDA. Um, and it will focus on conservation practices given the nature of the 508 process. I can't get into the specifics, but we are actively working on, on a second submission and we are eager to hear from producers about um, how we can use the 508 process um, to support the adoption of conservation practices that backed up by data and analysis. And just to underscore what you're hearing on this is we always say that the foundation of our work is, is leveraging big data sets and rigorous analysis uh, to prove the correlation between these practices and, and yield variability and risk. And so we will be doing that with other conservation practices. And then on the question of whether it could be expanded to other crops. Um, right now, we're gonna be very focused on looking at how to improve this product and expand, but I would say it's certainly not off the table that we would be looking at other crops. Right now, we've um, in particular uh, collected data and done the data and analysis around non-irrigated corn, but uh, again, there's uh, no reason to consider taking other uh, options off the table. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll pause there. Real quick, Bill, to add on to that, Todd, mm -hmm. on the practice question, I think it's worth noting, you know, one mm -hmm. of the reasons that we were so interested in the direction we wanted to go with the 508 process versus, say, a rebate or a, an increased subsidy on these program or these practices, um, like we see with the pandemic cover crop program or some of the state-led uh, cover crop programs that are out there, was because we don't want to really open Pandora's box, right? We don't want to start saying all of a sudden that maybe we should incentivize farmers that are are doing something say that we we want to offer this up to farmers that are under 200 acres or whatever that x may be and we want to make sure that what we're looking at is really looking at the insurance product for what it's intended to do which is to mitigate a true risk and a lot of that we've heard a lot today comes down to being science and data driven and being actuarially sound in what that risk is and allowing farmers that tool that they can trust to help mitigate that risk versus you know, pushing an agenda through on, on a rebate or, or something like that. And so that's one thing that we feel really strongly about um, in being able to offer a true insurance product uh, for a farmer to use is just knowing that there's confidence behind it when it comes to the data and the science and, and the reasoning behind it. Okay, thanks, Megan. Uh, David, we have some more questions uh, for you. Uh, uh, our couple put together here is how do you how do you determine uh, how do you how does a, how does a grower prove the weather weather event uh, prevented them from applying the nitrogen and how do they prove that their crop is uh, uh, nitrogen stressed so um, like uh, most folks should be familiar with the insurance already there's still a notice of loss so hey I wasn't able to put it down so you, you'd put your notice of loss in the adjuster would come out and one of the things that the product has developed is um, this tool basically that to look at, you know, um, the amount of days that were available to apply. Um, and so the adjuster can use this tool that basically looks at uh, a weather calendar more or less um, along with actual experience to make that determination of whether or not it was possible. Um, I won't go into details as it's a fairly lengthy part of, of, of big handbook on how to go through that, but uh, the adjuster does have some kind of clear cut guidance on how to use, um, you know, what, what is enough time, what's reasonable. Um, and I would suggest that if you're looking at this, talk with your agent about that um, to, to understand exactly how, how that would work. Um, and it is an area, like I said, that I think it will be a bit confusing at first to some people, um, but it is, it's not meant to be a gotcha, right? It's, it's meant to be a, a reasonable control on truly could you get in there or not? Um, I mean, we understand most producers aren't gonna just sit on their hands and do nothing. They're gonna try to get that nitrogen on. They understand the value of that. Um, but uh, there, are, there is a model for that. Um, the same thing um, goes into nitrogen stress. Um, the, our loss adjustment uh, handbook provides guidance to these adjusters on what they're looking for. I think the traditional stuff is you see the kind of yellowing at the tips of, of the leaves on, on a, a corn stalk, but um, it gives us a series of diagrams and exactly these are the types of things that would exhibit nitrogen stress. Um, and so again, that is a, an adjuster determination 
Um, but of course, the producer has the same rights as you'd be familiar with the normal policy to work with the adjuster, make sure they're looking at the right things, taking the samples in the right parts of the field, um, those types of things. Um, and ultimately, if there's a disagreement, uh, still have recourse. Um, but um, that is all defined within a, a pretty lengthy handbook on how to uh, make those evaluations for the loss adjuster. We have another questioner who wants to know if uh, a couple of questions actually if all types of nitrogen are uh, eligible and another questioner wants to know about uh, three how how three applications of nitrogen uh, would be handled if you get your first two on does a third is a third one uh, and you don't get your third on is that essentially not covered so, so are all types of nitrogen? Yeah, so it, it's going to base, be based on labeling. Um, so that, that kind of N label when you have you know, your, your three numbers on your uh, N, P, and K, um, it's, it's that N. So any, anything that would qualify for that, that traditional labeling um, is, is kind of how they use the guide to determine that. Um, and then, um, yes, it doesn't have to be two. It can be multiple applications. But you just when you do your sales closing, you have to have that plan of what percentage of nitrogen you have planned to go in in that kind of V3 to V10 stage, and, and that being what's pre pre uh, prevented from being applied, that's what feeds into the, mo the loss model of how much you would um, get paid. Hopefully that explains it. Okay. And uh, this could be, Bacon, you wanna, uh, may wanna uh, chime in here as well. We have some uh, questions about uh, the training that's being done uh, are the AIPs ready to uh, adju uh, consistently adjudicate these endorsements? Uh, what kind of training is being done for them? Uh, and uh, what kind of training is being done for claims adjusters? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, so in Illinois, I can speak to what, what we've been working on. Like I said, we did coordinate uh, that webinar and reached out with the AIPs as well uh, to ensure that they were uh, promoting and making their agents aware of this training on top of what they've already done. Um, we were happy to hear that a lot of the agents that participate in our webinar said that they had been um, doing other trainings within their, their AIPs um, and, and starting to feel familiar with this. You know, we do and are aware that, you know, the details of this uh, product came out in January and uh, tight turnaround to get to March 15th. And, and as David and the administrator and Todd, we've all talked about, you know, we expect there to be some growing pains as we get through this. And, and we're trying to get to March 15th and try and get some momentum and, and then really regroup and focus on on this summer to make sure everybody's, um, you know, being able to, to be successful and, and think about this split application nitrogen going into the fall. Uh, but for training, you know, I, I again, uh, being in Illinois here, I can talk to University of Illinois and their farm doc team. There are several webinars that have been put together, the online tool uh, to work with, some documents, white pages. Uh, there's a, a plethora of resources here uh, to help guide some of these conversations. And, and um, again, these webinars are great Q&A where a lot of these questions are coming up and being answered as well. Well, so I'd encourage anyone to, to check out those resources uh, if they're still looking for some information. Okay. Uh, we have a coming back question again about the biologicals. Uh, if they're not uh, if they're not being considered, why not? If you're if you're trying to address climate, if you're trying to address uh, nutrient runoff, obviously those biologicals are designed to do just that. Anybody, anybody address that? Uh, maybe I can, I can start and, and, and Megan, if you want to add in, um, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anytime you're piloting something new, you want to limit the number of variables you're trying to deal with year one, right? We need to get some good mm -hmm. solid data and work and expand from that. Yes, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity. This product can go in a lot of different ways in the future, but, uh, you know, our board, you know, needs to consider a lot of different angles, interest of producers, interest of the taxpayers, um, and ultimately be able to collect the data necessary to build on something. Um, so I, I think that's part of it, but you know, I don't know, Megan or Todd, if, if you wanna add to any thoughts on that, please do. Yeah, I think you're you're right on with just having that you know really core data set to begin with as we get this launched and being confident in the products that we have. You know, there's a lot of interest in biologicals, especially this year where we've seen fertilizer prices go. Um, a lot of growers are, are looking for things outside the box to help with that nitrogen need, knowing that's probably your number one uh, you know macronutrient that the corn crop needs. And so, as as David said, I think we're very open to be looking at um, you know changing things in the future and seeing where the data goes. But we want to make sure that that, that 
that data set really is uh, concise and solid before we would add in products uh, to make sure that, again, the, the confidence level is high in, in whatever we're offering. And Todd, uh, looking forward because you all are, are doing the data, uh, I wanted to ask you to wrap up about uh, the project you're doing with the University of Illinois, uh, looking back to 2019, um, um, prevent plant, but uh, what kind of, the idea here is right to reduce, uh, ultimately reduce nitrogen applications to some extent, uh, is it not, or, or just to make sure that as much as possible is being done in season rather than left in fields over the winter. And uh, is any data going to be collected uh, ultimately on this to determine what impact this uh, pace has? Yeah, absolutely. We'll be working again. We're, we're very focused on the March 15th deadline, but then we'll again we'll be working with our partners to be collecting uh, data, working with farmers that have uh, purchased paste to understand how it affects, uh, well, how it's affecting the use of split nitrogen practices and, and how it's affecting the use of, of nitrogen in the field. Um, and really, again, going back to the kind of focus on data and analysis is collecting that data doing the analysis to understand um, how this is affecting practice adoption and how it's affecting use. And then uh, extrapolating from there, again, based on data analysis, what are the implications for GHG emissions and water quality? So that is part of our longer term strategy here is to look at um, both those adoption issues, but also the, the climate and other co-benefits, uh, including but not limited to water quality. So that that is, certainly part of our longer term strategy moving forward. And did you want me to talk about the prevent plant pilot? I'm conscious. Yes, of please do. That's one of your more interesting projects okay. that uh, kind of answers some of the questions about the other, the other conservation uh, uh, practices and, and uh, what might be coming down the pike. Right. Well, I'll, I'll give a very brief synopsis given the time, and then you can find more information on the AGREE E2 Coalition website, which is foodandagpolicy.org. Um, we have a partnership, an MOU between USDA, uh, Meridian Institute, and the University of Illinois to look at 2019 when there were approximately $4 billion in prevent plant claims. And the University of Illinois team is leveraging uh, data, um, both uh, publicly available and private data sets to look at how the use of cover crops and tillage strategies, reduced till, no-till strategies um, correlated to prevent plant claims. And that work is underway by the team at University of Illinois. And this is just one example of the type of data pilots that we are particularly excited about. We think it can, the outcomes of this analysis can help inform decision-making at the farm level. It can help inform uh, the work that's being done by RMA and other policymakers, uh, and and more, and so we really, you know, again, really uh, see a lot of value in these types of data pilots, and we're looking forward to the outcomes of of the work that the University of Illinois team is doing. And again, that's been a strong partnership between Meridian, USDA, and University of Illinois. And you know, I think this is goes back to, you know, farmers want to understand how the practices that they've been using. Um, affect uh, farm profitability and and what how it correlates to uh, con or to conservation benefits again, uh, including water quality, for example. And Administrator so, Bunger, there's, there's a still, lot a lot to this pilot, but go ahead. Any, uh, I'll give you any final thoughts, Administrator. Yes, um, thank you. You know when we talk about um, feedback and AIPs and agents. Um, also, for everyone listening, that we provide a wealth of information on our website. We are communicating daily with AIPs with questions around PACE, and there is on that website, RMA, USDA.RMA.gov, um, a Q&A with lots of answers to a lot of the questions that you probably are thinking of. So I would encourage you to also use that as a resource. Um, and I want to say thank you to everyone here today. I think we provided a lot of good information. Um, and of course, thank you to David. He um, 
she gets to answer all of the hard stuff. So thank you again for having USDA RMA on your um, program. Yeah. Well, thank you, Administrator. Thank you uh, for all of our panelists. And thank you, uh, thanks to the Meridian Institute for sponsoring this webinar. Um, in case you missed a portion of the event or would like to share it with friends, we will post a recording uh, again at uh, agripulse.com later today. You can also find links to the PACE resources that we discussed today at agripulse.com. Thank you and good day.